Good evening, first of all. I want to convey the apologies of uh, His Royal Highness Prince uh, Turkil Faisal, who had to leave because of uh, a situation, family situation, so he conveys to you his uh, gratitude and uh, thanks you for being with us and asks you to hopefully, if we do this again, to be with us again. What I would like to do with your permission is more of a follow-up uh, to the conversation that has taken place for the last two days. Not that I have been able to listen carefully to each and every word, because I've been popping from one policy circle to another, or doing the technical stuff here, but because I have been able to listen to some messages, major messages that I heard through the last two days. And I'd like this session to be more of a follow-up, and also I would like to call on the facilitators of the sessions to uh, give us the walk away. What are you walking away with for having spent four hours uh, moderating or facilitating these sessions? So, but I also would like to start with board members uh, to whom I very much cherish. And I would like, because the only person here who is uh, a woman, and that as it happens, not of course intentional, uh, but she has to leave. That is why Mireille is set, seated at the very end, because she's going to take a flight for her three young boys. So we have to let her go early. Uh, Mireille, what is your walk away? You have spent two days, and this is the third summit that you uh, attend. So give us your walk away. Actually, I just want to thank you first for these lovely uh, thinking, uh, thinking <laughs> process for the past two days was pretty enriching, to say the least. So thank you. What, I, what, I've, um, what I've noticed and what I've uh, cherished that education took a big chunk of, uh, of the discussions, was it in the policy circles or on the panels. So um, I believe dearly and uh, I firmly think that with education we can do the changes we need, we can embrace the 2020s as we wish, and we can <coughs> practically try and implement the visions and the ideas, was it in, in the economy, and the knowledge economy, and the fintech, and even on the political scene, that we wish to, to see coming true in the 2020s. Thank you very much, Mireille. Uh, may I just a little bit venture into a controversial matter right away. I would like to know, uh, I would like to address something that uh, Andrei Fedorov said. He said that we have been thinking for two days talking about uh, the possibility of peace, the possibility of uh, solutions, how do we fix it, but have we thought of the possibility of war? I don't want to sound pessimistic, but I just would like to sound you out on this one. Jared Petraeus, would you, as a general, take the first shot on that? The, the scenario of war, how possible is it? How, how much should we keep it in mind? And which war, what war, what cost? Can you address this as a general and tell us uh, who's going to win it? <laughs> that is um, many more question marks uh, on a single question than one usually gets. Um, I don't think, if you're talking about potential war between uh, a US-led group and Iran, uh, it's pretty clear to me that President Trump doesn't want war with Iran, and it's equally clear, I think, that the supreme leader in Iran doesn't want war uh, with a US-led coalition. That doesn't mean that Iran <coughs> won't continue to feel the edges of uh, U.S. restraint um, to try to figure out where the red line is that if crossed the U.S. would actually have to respond. Mm. But, but at the end of the day, I think you'll see the United States in Iran sit back down. We have very clearly, the U.S. has through its maximum pressure campaign and withdrawal from the Joint Comprehensive Plan of agreement has clearly put Iran into a box, into a corner from which it has no exit. To, to a slight degree, though, we've put ourselves in a box uh, as well. And I think at the end of the day, we're going to have to end up back at a table. But, but let me, oh. actually, if I could make a point that I really 
my takeaway from this is wrapped up not just with the discussions that we've had uh, in here, but also what's gone on literally during the course of this weekend. And as I'm trying to sort of understand the implications of the U.S. withdrawal from northeastern Syria, uh, I'm reminded that Las Vegas rules do not apply in places where extremists uh, are active. In other words, what happens there does not stay there. That's what's supposed to happen at Las Vegas, as you know. Uh, rather, what happens when extremists exploit ungoverned or inadequately governed spaces, which clearly northeastern Syria is going to become, no matter what happens with the, uh, the Bashar al-Assad regime supported by Russia and, and so forth, uh, clearly the ISIS is going to be resurgent out of this. And at the end of the day, there will be once again another tsunami of refugees, uh, instability, extremism, uh, and so forth flowing from Syria, uh, which will have uh, bad consequences, not just for the neighbors, but for uh, very likely our Western European NATO allies again as well. And I think that that is deeply concerning and it reminds us that if you don't do something about these situations, that that is the result. Usually the U.S. has to lead such efforts. You want it to be a coalition. You want to include Muslim countries. It has to be a comprehensive campaign, not just as Daniel uh, Pletka reminded us, counterterrorism is not enough to counter terrorist uh, elements. And it probably has to be sustained right. over a period of time, which means it has to be sustainable in terms of the expenditure of blood and treasure, which I think is doable, and I would have contended was being achieved uh, in that modest commitment of well under 2,000 uh, U.S. soldiers. I, I, would, I want to get into Syria, and, and this is uh, going to require coming back to the issue of Syria with you, General. But what I had in mind is that everybody keeps telling us, uh, no, the United States does not want war the, uh, uh, in this region, the Gulf regions, the Arab Gulf regions, uh, the Arab Gulf countries in uh, this region do not want war. But what if, this, what if really the only solution that the Revolutionary Guards finds for itself under the circumstances which is very strict sanctions which might really impact the regime in Tehran negatively and they may decide it's to my advantage to, to call in and draw in a military engagement. What happens next? What, we should think about that. What if this is the Iranian decision that they need a military engagement in order, in order to really save the regime from uh, either an internal implosion or from, uh, you know, accountability by their own people. So can I, you just I'm, address that, the possibility sure. of Look, war? I'm, and I then want to call I'm it I'm quite confident that my successors at U.S. Central Command uh, have worked through a whole variety of different scenarios together with uh, uh, their interagency partners on if this, then what. And I'm sure uh, that they have, again, worked their way through if, Iran does this, then we would have to do that, or at least these would be the options. But I don't see this escalating completely out of control. Oh. I see this as Iran has now forced us to take an action. We must show that we will not accept what they have done. We have to reestablish deterrence while also shoring up our defenses. Keep in mind, again, as I think a number of us mentioned yesterday, uh, at a time when it seems as if the U.S. is trying to withdraw, and indeed is withdrawing its forces from northeastern Syria, 1,500 or 1,000, whatever is left, we've actually, over the course of months, added to our forces in the Gulf yes, region yes. by some 14,000 soldiers, the latest of which were just committed again while we were here. Abdullah Bashara, you are from the Gulf. You were the GCC Secretary General, and you had to deal with this. What if Iran's decision is actually that they need a war. And not Iran as the country. What if the Revolutionary Guard's decision is that they need a war? Thank you. Just I have to salute you for your effort. Thank you. Thank and you and your collaborators. Thank you very and much. And you gave us a heavy meal, Thank heavy you. menu for two days. But, I, but let me tell you uh, that two issues, heavy issues, which are absent from this seminar. One is Yemen which is a strain, and Palestine, 
without which there is no tranquility in this, in this horizon, in this region. Mm. So hopefully in the future. Now I come to Iran. Iran is not suicidal. Iran has a huge inventory of notoriety and mischief. And uh, provocative, yes, but it outpatient all area. And they are going to make noises, irritate, but they will, they will, far, will stay far away from confrontation. There are two, ah, sorry, sorry. The, the Gulf region is safe and solid, and it's solid, it's uh, solidness is confirmed over the passage of time. And don't, don't uh, we, are, we are not concerned about our, our region. Yeah, but the question is, if Iran's decision is that it needs a war, even if it's a limited war, even if it's a limited war. Oh, no, war, Iran is not suicidal. All right, it's so not, you don't think so. Uh, Iran is not in league with uh, Saddam or Gaddafi. Right, so you, 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 you think that you would not be drawn into a war no matter what, because Iran is not suicidal, and you're not even willing to consider the, no, the, the, they, the, the potential, right? As a will, scenario. Yeah, they will outwit, out patient everybody. That's all. The, the, I cannot hear you when you can't speak. Uh, okay, okay. Sorry. So what is it? What do you say? Uh, they will outwit, they will out patient everybody. They will wait. Out, okay, they, will, they will outwit with their patience everybody, says Abdullah Bshara. Brett McGurk. <laughs> so on this question, um, I think we can be hopeful that that's the case. I'm just a little more pessimistic. And I think, um, what does... What do the Iranians calculate when they're in their decision-making circle, and what's their, their grand strategic objective? It's to get the United States out of the region and to significantly weaken our overall place in the region. Uh, we are now withdrawing from Syria. I think this is what my friend General Petraeus would have called a non-biodegradable event. <laughs> uh, this is unfolding before the world in a chaotic manner. It was a disaster. Um, as we withdraw from Syria, they will be calculating. I think they know they don't want a war, and they also, I think, have figured out neither does Trump. And they will keep with these provocations here throughout the Gulf. It might be a tanker, it might be another drone. They'll start spin spinning advanced centrifuges to put the onus constantly back on Trump. And if anyone believes there's some strategic, thought out process at the highest levels in Washington to figure this out, I think they're mistaken. All right, so if they keep on provoking Donald so Trump, uh, show, that, show us how we sh we're thinking for the, next, for, for the next few years. What do we think? So, shall we conclude that no matter how much they provoke Donald Trump, they're not going to get their war, right? Is this well, let me give you a scenario. Uh, they do something that does provoke a response. <clears throat> Knowing how they think, I think they've already thought of their counterpunch. Which is that? It might be in Iraq, yes, it so might it be is. in Israel, it might be somewhere else. Uh -huh. And then, does the White House respond to that? And so, I think... If they, just paint the picture, we're leaving Syria. Um, they wanna try to paint us as a paper tiger. And I think right now they have some initiative. So I'm not saying that will happen, but we're in a very high risk window here, I think over the next uh, oh, so six, six to eight months. So you think we are in a window of high risk and being pulled into a war. Amr Musa? Somebody. Thank you. I believe the question... So, if, so if, uh, let me explain my question. The question... Because, because, because I'd like to entertain the idea that if we're thinking for the next uh, decade, we can't only dream that it's going to be all right. But what if it's not all right? Since you are talking about the next decade, we shouldn't have the question, only the question about the possibilities of war. No, it's not only, no. please, I beg of you. Yes, yes, somebody, I, I understand somebody you. Had listen, put to me, to the uh, table. listen to me. No, I just want to make sure we're not question. only... We're not I thinking have a war different only. question for the future of this region. Mm. What if the U.S. and Iran emerge from this crisis with better relations, even alliance? Not war between U.S. and Iran, but alliance between U.S. and Iran. Mm. At a certain stage, not only so, 
we have to think also of the same, mentioning Turkey, mentioning Israel. So don't waste your time talking about war and the possibilities of war. There will be no war between U.S. and Iran. And the answer was very clear from all the Americans, the high <laughs> Americans that are here. The question is, what kind of relations the U.S. has in mind or preparing to get to promote right. with Iran in particular, with Turkey and, of course, Robert, Israel. Robert Blackwell, I think what, what Hamra Musa is saying, really, is that we don't trust you. You know, you've been around, you come around and sold us down the drain, and we really don't trust you. And what we should think about, he's saying, we should think about the fact that the possibility that you may go around and do your deal with Iran behind our backs, and then this is what we really, Amr Musa is saying, we should th think about. This is right. you, also detrimental for us. Right. The likelihood of a U.S.-Iran alliance about, is about as likely as me being young and handsome. <laughs> uh, I want to say something about the likelihood of war. First, uh, it's exactly where we, was, where we should start uh, because if there's a war in the Middle East, it'll change everything we've talked about for two days. Mm. So it's exactly the place to start. I would point out the dangers of complacency. Here is a parlor game when you have your adult beverage this evening. Try to think of a war since 1914 that the Americans conducted that they thought they would fight two years earlier. See if you can think of one. Vietnam in 1963, Iraq in 2000, and I just go on and on and on. We ne this is a point Bob Gates made. We never predict where we're going to fight next and when. Never. So I just urge people to uh, not be complacent. And I'll, I'll finish like this, which is in the last, and, and Brett McGurk mentioned uh, this possibility, let's imagine in the last month, instead of uh, not using military force, uh, Donald Trump had responded to the attack on the Saudi oil facilities with an attack on the uh, Iranian uh, missiles in Iran. Mm. Who wants to predict confidently what Iran would have done? So let's imagine they kill, they blow up part of a barracks in Iraq and kill 28 Americans. America is outraged. No, yes. What does Donald Trump no, do? No. So, because, sorry, Robert, Regina, but, uh, I, I want to finish no. with this thought. If you believe this is possible, this, of course, is an argument for more intense diplomacy between right. uh, the parties mm -hmm. and Iran. If you're not complacent, you worry enough about a war that you engage diplomatically. You know, I want to, uh, since you mentioned diplomatic efforts and since uh, Salman Sheikh may have to leave early, uh, Salman Sheikh has been leading an effort uh, behind the scenes it's for Syria to see how could things be fixed, as, you know, track two and what have you. Oh, well, I'm sorry, do you have something really to report to us of success? Or are you going to tell us that something went down the drain after too many years of trying? Um, thank you. Um, I actually wanted to address the Iran question first oh, okay, before I come to Syria. If you don't mind. All right, do, go ahead, but then I'll then do Syria another round because I, will, I thought you were leaving. We have been running um, a track to dialogue on mutual regional security now for more than a year uh, with global power representatives. I agree with Brett that we're in a very dangerous moment, but it's really the various parties positioning themselves in a game of poker for the best position in a dialogue track. We're searching for that political dialogue track um, right now. And we know there are talks, informal talks, and other bilateral talks which are going on. Which ones? What are you talking about? On Iran? On Iran. Okay, tell Between us Iranians you, and okay. others, not just what, at the track. It, what are you reporting not to just us? At I the think there's some reporters level. here would, know to, would like to know what you're saying. Not just at the track two level, but also even between representatives of states or informal representatives of states. Mm -hmm. um, my bigger worry, so it may well be that the Iranians miscalculate in trying to level the playing field in the run-up 
to such talks. Um, my bigger worry is actually what the Iranians have learned with Syria. If you actually work with a sovereign state, your access of resistance becomes that much stronger. And I believe that is what they're trying to do in Lebanon. And I believe that's what they're I trying to do even in Iraq. In Just Syria, one, one in final... In Syria and Iraq, I'm going to get back to. I'm going to stay on the, on the thought on, on Iran, if you don't mind. I just... Sure. I, but on just Iran. one final thing, Ray. Right? You talked about possibility okay. of war in the 2020s. And here it came up in our policy circle as well. Mm -hmm. um, I believe in a much more um, multipolar world where US leadership cannot be taken for granted by itself. We will need a multilateral effort. And there's a fear that if regional rivalries are exploited, by multi, uh, multilateral, or by big power competition, this will only exacerbate. So we may well see a series of local conflicts which, which continue to be intractable. And exhibit A in that respect has been Syria over the past right, few years. I will get back to Syria. You lost, the, you lost the chance on Syria, but I'll get back. Uh, Andre Federov, well, you basically, basically, if I hear you correctly, when you warn us more than once about the scenario of war, um, shall I just ask you, are you expecting some more major uh, operations by the Iranians, uh, um, like the uh, Aramco? Uh, uh, is it, is it going to be the revival of attacking ships uh, in, the, in, the, in the high seas, in the, uh, in, 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 uh, you, in the Gulf? Well, what, what are you saying? Because you've been telling us yeah. about this. What are you uh, saying? Once again, I would like to stress that we have two Irans. One is Iran of Rouhani. The second is Iran of Revolutionary Guards. And it doesn't mean <coughs> that uh, the first level, Rouhani, will be much more stronger <coughs> in his political decisions than Revolutionary Guards. What I, from my personal positions, what I am expecting, I am expecting much more growing pressure from Revolutionary Guards on Rouhani in the coming two months. Okay, even, is, mm -hmm. even I'm not excluding, according to my Iranian sources, that <coughs> in two, three weeks, we'll face a new provocation in the Gulf. A new provocation in the Gulf? Yeah. Are we thinking attacks on ships, for example? And then yes. I want to get back to the military men before I take it somewhere else. Are you, are you thinking that? Yes, uh, the problem is the following, that uh, Iran is now feeling itself as a winner in the current situation because everything which have been done by Iran in the recent months was left unanswered. And that's why Iran has a feeling now that it could, first of all, to try to make a clash between US, Russia, European Union, and will try to blackmail all the sides to be a win again. And, okay, where is Sari al Qalam? Where is Mahmoud Sari al Qalam? I asked him to be here, uh, but I don't see him. Uh, our Iranian uh, expert. Is he here? Mahmoud, where are you? Okay, well, he's not here. I hope that he comes because he promised me to be on in, in, this, in this gathering. Uh, okay, this is, this is a disturbing thought, won't you say? I mean, if, if the question is if, if this is in fact what they have in mind, who's going to do what? Phil Gordon. Basically, like, you know, like the question in other words is that uh, would they uh, bank and count on the non-action of the United States? Is this the bottom line? Uh, sure. Um, and first of all, thank you for the opportunity to weigh in on Iran, not least because you owe me your personal answer to the issue I'm about to raise <laughs> from the policy circles, but uh, I'll do it again. And I think the answer is obvious. Um, you know, the answer that has sort of been batted around around here, uh, how Trump is going to react to gradual Iranian escalation, and he has answered that question. The Iranians are smart. They didn't, on day one, when the U.S. pulled out of the nuclear deal, do something dramatic, either with the nuclear program or militarily, that would have provoked a response. They tested and went very slowly and carefully. Sabotage attacks that were anonymous, tanker attacks, but made sure they didn't kill anyone, and then shot down a drone, and even though the president said we were quote unquote cocked and loaded, called it down after uh, 10 minutes before, and then a few months later took another further step, much more direct. So after all of that, 
you know, the answer is pretty clear. President Trump has signaled right. he has no appetite okay. for confronting Iran. All right, so... Uh, so And so that's where the question goes back so to you. So what options, right. exactly, so, then what options are the countries of this part of the world have? Uh, should they just go back to recalculating their alliances and redefining what is a security relationship all about uh, with the United States? Is this... What you're suggesting? They I think inevitably, I'm suggesting, first of all, it appears that they are already doing that. I think right. that the analysis I just gave is not controversial. Uh, I think it's obvious for Americans. I think it's what the Iranians have concluded, which is why they continue to take these steps, which put pressure on the United States. And so what was Trump's response to uh, Iran striking the heart of the world's oil supply? It was to show up in New York and explore the possibility of a deal with the Iranians in which we would lift sanctions without getting what we wanted. And, and, and here's what I was going to come to, given where we are now. I think this is not controversial uh, and not disputed in Saudi Arabia and the UAE either. Everyone has reached the same conclusion. And so the question to our friends in the Gulf is what conclusion they draw from that. And I'll put out there, it looks like they are drawing the conclusion that the worst of all worlds is to have a confrontation with Iran that is not backed by the United States, so they better start looking at alternatives, yeah, including okay. talking well, to the Iranians. Well, okay, but I think they also have been looking at alternatives in building better relations with China and Russia. This has not been born yesterday. They sort of read the... the, the what do you call it on the wall? The, the red the what? The signs on the wall or something? Writing is on the, the wall. The writing's on the wall. Uh, but but I, I don't have too many people from the Gulf, unfortunately, here. But uh, I, I will ask Nabil Fahmi. Uh, yeah, so, uh, basically, uh, what I hear from my American uh, friends is that basically you go figure it out yourself. This is not, you know, it's not Nabil Fahmi is right next to you, please. So you go figure it out. I mean, you know, why are you talking to us about it? We have made up our minds. You're not going to be dragged. We're not going to be dragged into any wars when we even can talk to the um, Iranians if we so feel uh, necessary for us and, you know, go to the drawing table again. So what is it if you can think of what do we do? do what, is this a good thing that's happening? Maybe that we, the Arabs will have to think differently on of how to, uh, to, to do security and security relations? Well, I've always been arguing that we do have to think differently, but I prefer to think differently long-term rather than short-term in a crisis situation. So uh, my, my answers to your questions are very close to Philip's. If you look at what's happened on the ground, neither the Americans nor the Iranians in their right mind would want to go into a full-out confrontation with each other now, and they clearly would prefer to find some other way, hopefully diplomatically, although they're not anywhere close to finding a consensus on how to move forward. Uh, you may, however, have either a limited set of operations, not targeted at American facilities, but targeted at Gulf facilities, but and vice versa, or you may have war by mistake. No, but if now, you the have, but the question is really, and bear with me, the question is very clear. If the Iranians go ahead and do yet another one of, whether it is by uh, pretending, or not, not claiming responsibility or any such thing. Oh, speaking of the Iranians, I think, do I have you here now? Good. So, Mahmoud Sari al Khalam, please come and have the front seat. Uh, so what if, what if the, decision, the decision in Tehran was that right now they concluded Trump is not going to react, no matter what, and they concluded that, uh, you know what, we could push the envelope so, so long as, and they will avoid killing American soldiers. And then what do Arabs do if there is another attack on oil facilities or on tankers? Can you please address that? Well, again, in, in essence, Will there, could there be a miscalculation by the Iranians? Yes. The reaction that you're asking for, given the security situation today and the different players, the short-term reaction will be a problem because the Arab capacity militarily is okay. alone is not equivalent to the, to the Iranian one. The medium and long-term reaction should be that let's continue to have relations with the Americans, but let's also increase our own capacity uh -huh. and make sure that 
our positions are based not only on military capacity, but also on a larger international balance of relations. So it's a long-term problem. I want to do this, please. I'm going to take three, just three, on Iran. Uh, uh, Jean-Duc Anthony, uh, Alistair Burt, and uh, then I want to bring in uh, uh, Mahmoud Sari al Qalam. The only thing is that because I want to address other issues. That we, have, we have Sudan, we have Lebanon, uh, we have developments uh, in, uh, in, in Libya. We have, some, we have the young lady here from Tunisia. There she is. I want to hear her take about what has just taken place in Tunisia. So I'm going to just do just another a quick wrap up. There is Palestine. I want to I wanna ask about Palestine. I want to ask about, you know, um, okay, remind me to ask about Palestine because I know what I want to ask. So, um, Jean Duc Anthony. Y yes, <clears throat> much of the uh, description and analyses thus far <clears throat> have uh, followed uh, along a line of, of logical reasoning, uh, rational uh, reasoning there. Uh, this in itself uh, is dangerous. Uh, one needs to also think of acts that are audacious, that seemingly are illogical. If you want some great examples, you have Sarajevo and World War I. You have the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, uh, World War II. Uh, you <coughs> have 9-11, uh, for which uh, no one was prepared. Uh, you have, as well, Iraq's uh, invasion of Kuwait. I mean, right up to August 1st, people thought Iraq was bluffing. And August the 2nd, it ruled. That's four. We, could, we can name yeah, others. Let's so. go up. Yep. There was the 2020s rather than back because it's, okay. it's, no, I'm, I'm going to benefit from your wisdom putting, as to what next, uh, if you don't uh, mind. Uh, all right. A, a surprise attack that no one is even thinking about. Uh, the uh, trucks and automobiles that go under the high rises in Dubai uh, all day long, every day of the week. Uh, not all of them are guarded, not all of them are scanned or inspected. All it takes is one uh, for a skyscraper in Dubai or here uh, to be hit, to be crumbled. You, you just have to imagine what would happen to the international stock market and confidence, etc. Uh, Abdullah Bashar is correct. Uh, this place is not going to hell in a handbasket. It's uh, secure, it's stable, it's been peaceful, it's prosperous for the most part. You won't find six other contiguous states anywhere among the 130 de developed countries uh, that have been as secure and stable despite death being on their doorstep uh, over and over. With regard to the Iranian aspect in communications, today Iranians and Americans had tea in the United Nations, uh, in, in the breaks there, in the cloakroom. Uh, we're not bereft. We're not bereft of blemish. We're not devoid of default, a defect. We're not free from flaw. Uh, the means are there. That's a back channel. It's away from the, from, okay, from so the you, media. Okay, so you think that the, the black a back channel, not black channel. A back channel is the best way to to go about it, to fix it. Uh, no matter, and then, then to and therefore, it. and therefore, to lie low, even if there is another provocation. Is this what you're saying that the Arabs should really lie low? Uh, uh, that's, I heard somebody on television say he he, he was a Saudi, and he says in the, the Bedouins say blauha. Uh, so, mm. so I don't know how how do you translate it, you know, and no, and no, you know, chuck, chuck it up, chuck. What is the? And no, let it let it pass. Mm. Just, just, just let it pass. Because if you don't, then you're doomed. Is this what you're suggesting, Jean Duc Um A little bit of that, uh, but uh, I go for the United States not wanting a war and Iran <laughs> not wanting a war there. But you have the lone wolves. Uh, that can upset all the logic, all the rational yes. reasoning as such. Uh, and it's happened uh, over and over and over. Iran is on a roll and a run with regard to Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon, all the way to the Mediterranean. The analogy would be that Mexico is taking back uh, uh, Texas or California. They're not going to give it up. And that's mm. been a tsunami of a geopolitical change. Okay. Whether we can adapt to that remains to be seen. Whether How Israel can 
remains to be seen. Hold that thought because I'm going to get back and uh, uh, just give me so many ideas. Uh, help me out by being very quick at it uh, on the issue of Iran. Uh, and I guess maritime security is now in your hands. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll try and be very quick. Let me put something into the mix that we haven't quite heard yet. I, I speak as a signatory nation to the JCPOA and still a signatory nation to the JCPOA and thereby hangs my tail. Brett's right, the, the long and medium term aim of Iran has got to be removing US influence and, uh, and continuing its development as a regional power. But its more immediate short term is to get back the chance to sell its oil because it's being strangled. And Iran is looking for a way to get out of the economic trap that it's in mm. because it's causing real damage at home and it's provoking further competition between IRGC and other elements of the Tehran administration. It's been absolutely right. They've been very carefully calibrated in their responses. They've done nothing on the nuclear track that isn't very quickly retrievable. And the question is, what are they probing for? If we work on the assumption that nobody wants war, then everyone's got to talk. Mm. Who wanted the talks most in New York? Was it President Trump who wanted a picture of himself with President Rouhani? Why didn't the talks go ahead? Or was it the Iranians who wanted the talks? I just think we need to think it through from that point of view. If there is a further provocative action, will it be more calibrated? It's always going to be dangerous. Sooner or later, there's an overreach and then there's a disaster. But if we want to avoid that, we should be going down the other track. How can we get, and Amar Gargash wrote about this in the Financial Times last week, how do we get talks to get not the JCPOA back because it's got to go further than JCPOA. How do we do that? Back channel, whatever, it doesn't matter. But that has got to be done to avoid the next act which could bring us disaster. But I think Iran is looking for that, or some elements are. Well, that's Mahmoud uh, Al-Qalam. Is uh, Iran looking for that? I mean, is Iran looking to have uh, uh, the old uh, agreement but would they accept the old agreement plus to not to throw it down the drain, just you know the old agreement plus something plus changes? Is Iran really looking for what Alistair Burt said? Because I'm going to tell you something. Um, from the point of view of the Arab region, the Arab countries, yes, they do care about the nuclear and the ballistic missiles, of course. But most of these these countries say, like, we have a problem with Iran's ambitions regionally. So, I want to ask you, why do you think Iran feels entitled to demand of the world to respect and to acknowledge its self-proclaimed right to have paramilitary forces in sovereign countries, in Arab sovereign countries? Can you explain that? Here's the mic to you, and can you tell us how can we... Like, you know, can, can, can we dream that you could adjust that? That, some, that people in Tehran who are ruling, will they really at all give this up? Or is this the raison d'etre and that's it? There's nothing we can do about it. We have to go figure it out. Um, Iran's regional uh, policy uh, goes back to the mid-1990s. Um, and I recall at that time when the idea of regime change was entertained, not by government officials in the United States, but, but by think tanks uh, uh, in, in the US, the Iranian reaction in the mid-1990s uh, was twofold. One, to reactivate the nuclear program, and second, to, uh, uh, to uh, become extremely active at the regional level. Um, I think this is fundamentally defensive. This is uh, for the purposes of national and political survival. I don't think it is offensive. Uh, can it go on for long? Uh, Iran must balance uh, between its regional ambitions and its national economic development. In many ways, at a much smaller scale, Iranian uh, behavior is kind of similar to the Soviet Union in the 1970s. So I think it cannot go on too long, uh, uh, the, uh, the regional reach, because of the uh, uh, deficiencies that it's causing at the national level. Um, one idea that I'd like to propose is this. 
As I talk to my Arab friends, my Western friends, I barely see or hear or read um, about the future assessments of, of Iran. Who has uh, more or less an accurate uh, portrait of Iran in the next 10 years? I think that is so crucial yeah, okay, to how except, countries except are going to... Let me just say something, yeah. Mahmoud. Uh, do you look at the actions of Iran right. in Lebanon uh, right. by uh, building up uh, Hezbollah that is that's, uh, that swears allegiance to uh, to Ayatollah Khamenei? So you know it's, this is not a normal state to be in. Uh, whether the, I mean, why is it that you expect us to accept? that you run paramilitary forces in our own countries right. that really will have you know, to allegiance to you. Why is that normal? There is no other country in the world that claims such a right. Why do you expect us to understand that? And how can we... And is it, I mean, just start, start with that, sure. then I want to go back to Alistair's point. Iran's behavior is the behavior of an unsatisfied uh, state at a region where it has no... Uh, strategic relations with any country. I think uh, in many ways it's like China again in the 1960s. And as, as I have discussed uh, over the last two days, I think the only way to go about this is uh, engagement with Iran. But engagement with whom? Uh -huh. Okay, it's not, uh, and everybody has learned from the uh, 2000s that it may not produce any results to uh, have an engagement with the government or the administration in Iran, per se. Mm -hmm. And I have suggested that the Arab countries do reach out to the deep state in Iran. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, when was the last time that an element of the Iranian re uh, deep state... Who is the deep state in Iran? I mean, what is the deep state I in Iran? I leave that to your imagination. No, 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 no. Because it's, it's really, it's not, no imagination needed. At least uh, it's assumed that it's really the... the I'm not going to put you on the spot and, any further, but really it, there is no clear definition or knowledge because it's deeper and deeper and deeper. It's how many layers of the revolutionary guards do you have? And we know you have supreme leadership, which is understood. But if, is, this, is, this like, is, there, is this reasonable? Is this a suggestion, really, that, it, that you're suggesting there, are, there is a deep state that could be reached out to? I think so, yes. And, um, and I, have a, I have a presumption in proposing that. Mm. I think uh, because of the uh, lack of communication between the deep state, and particularly Arab officials, Mm. Uh, there's quite a bit of misunderstanding. Mm. Uh, a lot of people would do continue to refer to Iran as if it is 1980 now. Mm. I think Iran has gone through a tremendous revolution, uh, evolution over time. Mm. And there needs to be uh, an understanding between the two sides. There is no communication. There is no understanding uh, of the other side. And the other thing, if I may just add one more yes, point, please. is that uh, very few people... Um, uh, I think, understand the domestic structure in Iran. Uh, as though Iran is a collection of a few politicians, and uh, there is not much understanding of the landscape, of the people, of music, of entertainment, of the educational system. There is so much going on in Iran that needs to be understood. And I think Europeans have done a good job in trying to reach out to that non-political aspects of Iran. Yeah, well, that, 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 that cultural Iran, the, the wonderful Iran that expressed itself, a lot of people here know. It's the argument, the argument is not about Iran that you're talking about. The argument is with, with a certain way of ruling that is controversial, to say the least. Uh, do you think, Muhammad Alim, do you think that, you know, if you understand the, the deep state in, the, in, in Tehran, that's going to be able to impact uh, the way Hezbollah acts in Lebanon. I mean, this, you know, this is, this is a problem. Uh, everybody knows that Hezbollah is very powerful and it's supposed to be part of the fabric of the society uh, politically. But when it says, you know, I have, and I work, you know, allegi uh, you know this, is, this is where I am. This is my identity, Iran first. My identity Lebanese, but my, my reference is Iran first defending Iran. How do you figure, what, what do you do in a country like Lebanon? How do you think? What, 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 do, you, what do you do about it? Well, I, I guess first that the Lebanese example um, would bring us back to an earlier question. Um, 
I probably need a couple of minutes just to go on with this. Um, war is already there. And uh, one of the main differences with version one and two of this summit is that in this summit, everybody seems to be um, okay with the idea that it's gonna get worse before it's gonna get worse. So it's inevitable. Everybody's gonna get to the problem and we're not facing the problem as it should be. On the deep state issue, I don't agree with the fact that this is something that is left to our imagination. We, knew, we know who is there, and it's probably once you solve the problem with this identification of deep state, you may solve the problem, which is an easier problem with Mr. Rouhani or whatever is kind of a, a secondary um, command. Um, I've heard so many ideas, so many uh, uh, thinkers and movers uh, uh, talk each about their own situation and their own strategies. It is clear that there is a US strategy, uh, a Russian strategy, a Chinese strategy, even a European strategy of not doing much in, this, uh, in the meantime. I would uh, give a very simple comment uh, that is a legal comment, uh, saying that I have never heard of um, uh, 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 an agreement, like the JCP, that stays alive with one party. So, when the Americans departed from the agreement, there was still an agreement, but Iran decided to depart from the agreement. Now the Europeans are alone in the agreement. I don't understand, really, from a strategy point of view, where this will be heading. Now, what may be called upon is the real formulation of a strategy that is a bit more advanced than what we've tried before in the Israeli-Palestinian uh, uh, conflict and the famous 2003 summit in, in Beirut. Uh, we need to put actual uh, issues. We reckon that Iran is a big part of the problem. They are in uh, almost most of the conflicts. They are in Syria, they are in Lebanon. They're very strong in Lebanon, and uh, they manage the conflicts there in an absolutely amazing manner. Uh, I would just give a quick example of something that happened today. Uh, Iran, uh, Hezbollah, is now trying to attack Lebanese banks as being responsible for the economic situation in Lebanon, which means that a chaos theory that would be in favor of Hezbollah is not to be disregarded at this stage. Um, importantly, there are other things that Iranians are not taking care of in the, in the, in the region. Uh, when we talk about education, technology, integration, all of this need to be addressed. A strategy is about to be uh, impossibly needed now. And this is what I think uh, you, uh, and a lot of the people that were with us for the last two days yeah, can help. Thank you. I'm gonna, I, I'm, you're going to stay in the picture, but I'm going to move to other, not only Iran, Gulf. I just really need to touch on other things, important things, and then... Uh, let me, did you want to say something on Iran? Because I want to move to Syria. Sirjan, Sirjan, did you want to say something on Iran? Because I want to just do something quick on Syria. And then I, and I want to really it go works. to Libya and, yeah. and, and Tunisia. Thank you, Ragida. I just wanted to say something, uh, not on Iran, but in relation with Iran. We have heard yesterday and today many times the term multipolar world. Though we haven't heard, what is this multipolar world about? Does it require new forms of multilateralism? Are the existing ones becoming lamb duck like the Security Council and others? And obviously we are in a vacuum and the case of Iran, the case of Syria, many other cases, are very, very characteristic examples of this vacuum. In the absence of such comprehensive multilateral decisions, we have and we are facing these days a behavior of Turkey, which we are going to see much more of it 
in the case of Syria and also in the case of Iran. Iran is abusing this vacuum. Yeah. People spoke about uh, playing poker, and it really uh, reminds me of poker, because even with the whole contradictions and confrontations we, which we had in the past, there was a chess party between the bipolar and then within the unipolar world. Now, we don't know what's the name of the game. Yeah, very good point. That's a good way for me to go into the issue of Syria via, via both the Iran and the Turkish angles, but also then, of course, I want to get to the Russian um, element of this. Let me ask um, Hoshar Zibari, what is on your mind when you see what Turkey has done? What options do you, as you know, you come from a, a, a dream, a dream that would one day Kurdistan would have been a real uh, a reality, and then you have what you have right now. Do you still have that dream, or do you just say, listen, I gotta get pragmatic. I'll take care of my Iraq, let them take care of their Syria, and let, let Iran, you know, I'm never gonna get away with what Iran will do uh, on the Kurdish issue, and of course, uh, leave it to uh, Turkey, and we know what the answer is. Can you look forward, just quickly, if you don't mind, if you just quickly take the, 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 the no, it's right here. If, if you quickly, just two minutes. Okay. But go forward, uh, rather, not thank go you. forward. Well, first of all, uh, I think the right of self-determination is a just rights for all the people of the world, including the Kurdish people, the Palestinian people, and uh, every other nation, I think, had, has that right, which is enshrined in many conventions. No doubt about it. How to go about that is, is another thing. Uh, we don't have an overarching policy to have a pan-Kurdish state for all the region of Kurdistan and Turkey and Syria and Iran. Really, I mean, all, the Kurds in Iraq, the Kurds in Turkey, the Kurds in Syria have their own, own policies to reach some uh, solution, you see, to this. I mean, uh, I'm now talking about Syria and all this talk about constitutional arrangements and bringing everybody on board, really to, before the Syrian were <coughs> denying any such existence of a different people, a different culture. Uh, in Iraq, we have uh, formalized our rights in a federal constitution. Mm -hmm. Which we are. Yes, and, and then mistakes have happened. And, no, no. And, and, but, but, you know, I just want to see what are you thinking now that what you, when you look at what happened and how the Americans reacted, what are you thinking? If you just thinking, am I going to be in a good place? Are we going to be in a bad place? I and mean, what are you thinking? If you go no, forward still we with believe that. The, uh, we believe in the friendship and partnership and alliance with our American friends, really. We have not given up hope on that. Yes, we've seen that happens in the past many times. In 1975, they dropped us uh, during the uprising in 1991 when they allowed Saddam, you see, to move against the Shia, the Kurds, and the exodus happened. And uh, many other occasions, really, we, we were let down. Uh, including two years ago when we had a peaceful uh, referendum move, you see, not okay. moving into <laughs> That's gonna take declaring us into different an independent. Uh, I think that was a turning point right, about right. the views of many people That's about right. American commitments to them. Now, what happened in Syria is also really is shameful. I mean, I've talked to many American friends after all the sacrifices the Kurds in Syria and the Kurdish forces lost over 10,000 dead people in the fight against ISIS yeah. and to promote the interest yes, of the war. Absolutely, everybody has spoken about that. No, everybody had, at this summit, everybody and spoke the about that. But you're going to have to help me just move forward yeah. with this. 
because I, and, 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 and very good point and has been made clearly in the summit and it's a very legitimate point. But think with me when I get back to you because let me go to the track two that was going on in Syria. And, and, and you know, you've got to just sort of like, again, uh, time is becoming uh, an urgent matter. Salman Sheikh again. And then I'll get back to you, on, you. on this issue. I'll be, I'll be as quick as I can because I appreciate uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of very good people here who should be speaking. But just to say on the track too, it's actually a lesson for the 2020s, Raghi, there. Um, I think too often we have worked, let's say, with Syrians in this case, from the northeast of Syria, Arabs and Kurds, since July 2017. It became not just a track two, uh, what was called a track 1.5 because it involved delegations from the Syrian Democratic Council as others who still were not buying into the self-administration authorities that had been formed. And it was a conversation about more inclusive governance. Now, that track over the last nine months has, had developed into a very good track where they were seriously discussing how to form political understandings. And it even in the last round discussed how to f form working groups to try and take that forward. The unfortunate thing, and here, from the, from the third meeting onwards, we had an American representative, we had a French representative, we had a British representative. But I must say that still, and this is what we have noticed throughout the Syrian conflict, not enough has, attention has been paid to the ideas that Syrians have been developing themselves as actually the solution to the problem. Mm. So if there was to be one lesson we learned for the 2020s, it is for the international community, even those who are funding such work, to pay much more attention. And I, and I just, to close off, mm -hmm. just to say that, in fact, Robert, Rob, Ambassador Ford, you, were, uh, you and I had that discussion in late 2011, how Arabs and Kurds were telling us in the northeast of Syria, please find a way to help us so we can stabilize this region so that Al-Qaeda, who were coming back across our doorsteps from Iraq, did not take hold. At that point, the international community didn't take note, and it didn't work fast enough here. Uh, now we have an extraordinary situation, of course, where the, the rug has been pulled under for those kinds of, of ideas, and we're now in an even worse situation, and I'm sure there will be a third round of trying to stabilize this area. Robert, did you want to say something about that? Did you want to, uh, just a very quick comment, if you don't mind? Robert Ford? No, um, Salman, I appreciate what you said, and I would just add that uh, while for sure the international could have done more, I think it's really important in a place like Syria to remember that ultimately the Syrians had and the Syrians have agency. And, and so we, whatever thinking about the 2020s we do, we have to think both about the people on the ground, the local people, and then the international community as well. Okay. Uh Maybe if uh, you want to say something quickly on Syria, Ramzi Ramzi, you are a man who worked on Syria. Uh, what's next for Syria? What do you see happening next? Is it going to be all right under Bashar al-Assad and that's what should have happened to begin with? Or is it really going to be a place where the Russians should think about it, that it becomes their quagmire if they don't fix it and if they don't you know, control Turkish ambitions and Iranian aspirations. Uh, I mean, are, are the Russians in a good place in Syria or are they not uh, concerned that it becomes their quagmire and the Americans are fine, they're just, and uh, you know, UN, UN efforts are history. Well, I, I remember uh, hearing in Washington uh, applying the pottery barn rule to, uh, to Syria. Yeah. You, break you break it, it you, you own, own it. it and the Russians uh, should take care of it. I think the Russians rose up to the challenge. I don't think they mind that, and I think uh, they've done so far, including what is happening today in the Northeast, is something that is, they had anticipated, and I think they will play a role there. But I think the issue now is in Syria. Uh, in spite of what you see in the Northeast, in spite of what you, the situation in Idlib, largely the war is winding down, it's over. So I think we need to concentrate on the political process, which has been 
in the making for a long time. We have a constitutional committee. I hope through it's this a mechanism. It's a long time. It's well, been in well, a long time think, with lots of people just, dead, you know, and it's been the well, it, it you know. Has. That's true. But I think we have to look ahead. Everybody made mistakes in Syria for the past eight years. Everybody. I mean, I do not exclude anyone. We have now a mechanism that has to be used to the fullest within the context of Security Council Resolution 2254. And there's been a lot of ideas that have been produced by various track two uh, efforts over the years. I think they should find their way into this constitutional committee and let's see whether it is able to produce something, whether the Syrians through this mechanism are able to agree but we have to help them doing that. I want to I wanna hear two, two pretty stories, if you will, before I go to Libya, because Libya is not a pretty story yet. I hope it becomes one. No, no, no exactly. That's why I'm moving away from Syria. I want to go to uh, Sudan, and uh, uh, the person, the you know, there she is. Uh, come, uh, can you sit here? Can, can I start with you first? Can you tell me, it's, it's, you know, what, what happened? If, if, if I am like uh, someone who just woke up in the morning after having been asleep for the last six months, and I'm going to say to you, what happened in Sudan? And where is it going to take Sudan? Is it, is it a nice thing that happened? And why? And where do you dream that in the next decade it will be, lead you to? When, within the next decade? It's a lot of questions. Yes, well, it's one question, actually, um, just different ways. <laughs> well, very briefly, for those who were asleep, um, Sudan underwent a remarkable transformation over the last few months. After 30 years of rule by Omar Bashir, the people uh, started an uprising in December that culminated in a peace agreement uh, that was signed in August. Uh, in the midst, there were significant confrontations and a lot of losses uh, to, to gain that victory. Um, that victory remains a half victory um, and a half revolution. Uh, you had the irreversible force of the, the pro-democracy movement uh, facing the immovable object of the, the military uh, leadership that has been in place. And under international pressure on both parties, an agreement was reached. And I think a lot of lessons can be reached from that that there is an alternative to the chaotic path of the uh, Arab Spring, uh, which is a negotiated transition. Um, but it's not just a rosy picture. And I think if we just sit, sit back and, and, and enjoy the euphoria of what happened, we're miss, missing the picture. I think everyone has a stake in making sure that that deal is honored, that that transition is uh, smooth, and that the terms of that deal are, are, are met because the risk of slippage remains very right. real. Uh, and that's why I think we need the international community to, to, to monitor the deal and help us through that, uh, throughout well, that well, transition. Well, you did, the in, uh, international community, does that, does that include inherently the uh, Arab uh, countries? Ab absolutely. Or, okay. Absolutely. And I, I think what happened in June when the massacre happened, it was a turning point for our revolution because Hitherto, I think largely the regional powers were in favor of the status quo, but after the massacre, it showed them that these elements that were in power are becoming a liability on those regional powers as well, and that the wave of democratization and, 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 and pro-democracy pro movement in Sudan is not reversible. And that led to a change in the calculus, albeit at a very high price, but Ultimately, it meant that they are realizing that their long-term interests of the regional powers are now better aligned with, with, the, with the Sudanese people and with a civilian democratic uh, Sudan that, is, that does not harbor terrorism, as did uh, Bashir, that is a bridge between uh, Africa and the Arab world. And that is an example that it is possible to have a successful democracy in this part of the world. Nice to hear, it, but something successful in this part of the world. Inshallah. Congratulations, inshallah. And how about you? Tell us what happened in Tunisia in the last couple of days, weeks, yeah, yesterday. 
or, or actually it started weeks ago, it actually started before uh, at the birth of the Arab Spring, but we're not going to go there. <laughs> so just tell me now, sure. it's been how do you feel and what is it? Go it's ahead. It's been an eventful few weeks in Tunisia and like uh, Sudan, the bridge between Africa and the Middle East, we're the bridge between Europe and the Middle East and uh, Africa as well. Um, so I'll give a brief overview. We had three elections in the span of one month and everything transpired peacefully and well. <laughs> um, and we're actually getting a little bit of election fatigue right now. Um, we had a legislative election, but first we had a first round of presidential elections that was finally concluded yesterday uh, with the uh, rollout of the second round of the presidential elections where an outsider uh, won. Uh, the first round, uh, about 20 candidates were kicked out, and then the second round, we actually saw that the... I like to think of it as a second form of a revolution. Mm. We first took to the streets, then we took to the polls, mm. and for the first time in our modern history, we actually have the cap capability to build our country the way we want. Not by a colonizing force, not by a dictator, but a country that is for the people, by the people, the way we envision it. And this is when and where the work begins mm. in every other way. And so it's uh, your, uh, yeah, right? It's nice. Yeah, we do. We do. Congratulations. Thank you. Congra and congrats yeah. to Sudan. Congratulations. As well. uh, yeah, you're a young man who comes from a tortured country. Uh, Shadi uh, and, 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 and uh, Sh uh, Shakir, you, you, you spoke to the men of wisdom today, but uh, you, you, know, you are from Yemen and Shakir, you, you, you were born in a refugee camp in Lebanon. You're a Palestinian who was born in a refugee camp and look where you are. You are both in fabulous places. You, know, you are a New York Times bestseller uh, with your tale of Tala. Uh, you are the head of uh, the uh, union, uh, in, I know it in Arabic, the Yale University students um, from MENA region, uh, uh, the president of, the, of that union. Um, your experiences are, are, are something that uh, some, we should just say, despite it all, it can be done. But what do you want to say? Somebody mentioned, uh, I think, Somebody mentioned that we should have been speaking more about Yemen. I think it was Abdullah Bashara who said, we have not spoken about Yemen. And I think that's what I was hoping that you guys did during the session to say what I wanted him to say to you, how do I get out from where I am? And you would have said to him, here's the roadmap. But since this didn't happen, do you have something to ask? What is your ask? as a man who's entering the next decade and who needs his country to be normal again. What is your ask? I, th I, think, I think with what's currently happening, we're not speaking enough about Yemen. We're speaking about Iranian influence. We're speaking about indirect influence in Syria and, and Iraq, and we have such a short-term memory not realizing that Iran is in control of Sana'a, the Yemeni capital. You have a Houthi militia who are positioned there. They're fully in control. We forget that they launched attacks on Abha. They launched attacks on the Persian Gulf on certain tankers. They took responsibility for the attacks on the Aramco oil fields, even though that seems uh, unrealistic. But I think we might wake up to a time where Yemen could be fully in control by Iran and that would really squeeze the Arabian Peninsula. And I don't think we're speaking enough about what's going on there. Um, it's a bit of a political stalemate. Recently, we saw the involvement of a second non-state actor, uh, you know, the Southerners who want secession. I think this complicates the matter even further in Yemen. Um, and if we do not, you know, pay as attention to that region, we could see you know, a decade full of disintegration and anarchy, and that will come back and will haunt the Arabian Peninsula. Mm. Who amongst the Americans will, is going to help me out here and tell me if, this is, if there is, in fact, a backtrack going on uh, on the issue of Yemen? Somebody, I, I know one of you will, will, knows, or many of you know, that, uh, in fact, there is an effort to engage uh, on the Yemen issue and try to find the solution. General Petraeus, I mean, uh, I, I tell you, I, one wonders why didn't the Americans help out uh, and give, you know, give intelligence uh, to the uh, Arab forces there so that they will avoid killing civilians. Uh, this would have been an easy thing to do. Why the U.S. has not done that? Is it just because they were afraid to become partners? Yeah. 
uh, is this what it is? I'll ask him. Yes. Phil Gordon, it's you. The one in the White House. That's you. That's you. The one who was in the White House and responsible for all of that. <laughs> well, thanks for that. Uh, <laughs> I'm a little bit surprised by the question because we're actually usually hammered for the opposite. There was an effort to. That was precisely the Obama administration's explanation for why we went along with, backed, didn't oppose a war that we had questions about. It was basically the logic, if they're going in, we might as well help them do it as efficiently as possible with the fewest casualties. So it's precisely that that we did, it didn't work well enough, and we're usually criticized for the opposite of what you suggested. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, if I may, while we're on this tragic question of Yemen, for five years... Yeah, is, 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 is there, I, I mean, I, I think it was Mattis, uh, Secretary Mattis, who last year, I think, he sort of gave us an idea of how do we get out of the mess in Yemen. I don't remember the day. It was at the, the Manama Dialogue, I think. Right? Is it, well, there was a then, moment the, when things flared up where Mattis and Tillerson made a strong case and right. gave the impression that the United States was going to start pressuring the Saudis and others to end the war, but that, that sort of dissipated and went away, and now obviously there's a big Congress-White House divide. Not, not, not to pressure, so you still don't want to pressure the Iranians, the Obama administration, right? Why only pressure the Saudis, not the Iranians? There you go. There, there should be pressure on, on Yemen as well. Well, as far as I know, friends. we have a total economic embargo on Iran. I'm not sure what you want us to do further beyond that. Okay, that's not your administration, for the record. <laughs> uh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, the United States has had a bilateral embargo on Iran through every administration since the Carter one. So, uh, you know, while... So, so, so just to walk away on... What is it on Yemen? Ah, of course we have. Abdullah Bashara, go ahead on Yemen. Just why don't you hold, hold, it for, uh, hold, hold the microphone for Abdullah, because Hello. he will talk with the mic. Right. Keep it like that, please. All right. Okay. Well, there is now uh, there's a, a round of contact by the representative of the United Nations to have a government, inclusive government, uh, with a hold view... The for him. Let, let him hold the mic for you, because that, that, yeah, that's a bit uh, better, yeah. Uh, what, uh, what I expect is that this assembly here would endorse a call for backing the efforts of the representative of the Security Council, who happens to be a British national, who, who, is in, in the, who obtained already the backing of the involved state, all of us concerned in the Gulf state, with a view to reaching a government on the basis of inclusiveness. All, and then eventually, a constitution a con that will envelop every, every faction, every ideology, and then, of course, election on that. This is the only thing. Uh, there is no, the, the revolution in, uh, in uh, Yemen failed to produce mechanism that ensures consensus among the people. Mm. Now, what is expecting from us here is really to back and endorse and bless the efforts of the Security Council, represented by the, the envoy who is now, who happened last yeah, week, I he was in I, yeah. I suppose there's, the, uh, right now he's, uh, uh, it just looks like it's the only way out for the time being. You're gonna get paid for having uh, <laughs> been such a good guy, uh, holding the mic. Shakir uh, Khazal, and, and this would go to also for, uh, uh, at one point, Hanan Ashrawi, maybe it's the same question really. I would like to know, how do you feel about uh, uh, the fact that, the, I, th I think, is it the Saudi team uh, that went to Ramallah, right? Is this what I saw in the news today? I, I tell you something, when I saw that they went to something called, uh, what is it, that it is Faisal Husseini, I remembered something, and actually, you know, I just want to just say that to both of you. I remember something that when I used to uh, speak to Faisal Husseini, he used to say in Arabic, تَعَالُوا إِلَى الْقُدْسِ لِتُنْقِذُوهَا he said, come to, Palestine, uh, come to Jerusalem, come walk in my, uh, to, to the Arabs, come walk our streets, come eat in our restaurants, stay in our hotels, it's okay, if you, even if you feel humiliated, it's okay, we, you know, but come be in Jerusalem to save, to, 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 to help us, to, and 
Of course, they haven't. And now they are starting at least one interesting development today that I want, Shakir, how do you feel about the football? Is it a football team? Is it, is it a football team from Saudi Arabia in Ramallah? Is that uh, something you would welcome? Uh, is, it, is it about time or is it not a good idea? No, abs uh, absolutely. Uh, I, I travel to Palestine um, every year and I like promoting it. Um, I think it's the first, one of our first steps actually towards, um, towards branding our cause. Because when the football team is coming today, it's 2019, they're posting about it, they're, um, they're interacting with people about it. And it should, be, it should be something like, something the Ministry of Tourism in Palestine should even promote it more. And, and I would love to even see uh, more, you know, more uh, holy trips, more, um, more activities between the Arab world and the people of Jerusalem and the people of Ramallah and everywhere in Palestine. I mean, you cannot distance a nation and then hope that the dialogue is gonna be available there. And Hanan Ashrawi, here we go, yeah, so you got it. And you and I, uh, of course, you, you and I know Allah Yerham Faisal al Husseini very well. So when he comes to your mind, of course, are you, are you on? Okay, good. Uh, the late Faisal Husseini, just to start with him, was a model of uh, leadership that, is, that we are in, in bad need of in the Arab world. He was a person of service, uh, of modesty, of uh, uh, genuine commitment and sacrifice, actually. So anyway, we miss him. Yes. <laughs> And I'm glad you mentioned him. And the, the stadium is called Faisal Husseini. Yes, that's yes, why I, I agree him. that in many ways we do want to be reconnected. We don't want to feel isolated. We want to have the Arab world engage us positively and so on. There are those who talk about normalization of the occupation. And there are those who talk about having to get permits from the Israelis to come to Palestine. And there are those who talk about having to go through Mm. Israeli crossing points since Israel controls all our borders, airspace and territorial waters, and our freedom of movement. But at the same time, there are those who say, no, when we reach out to the Israeli, to the Palestinians, we are going over and above the heads of what the Israelis to express solidarity. But what do you say? It, it reminds us that the Palestine finals in football and soccer were not carried out precisely because Israel refused to allow the Gaza team, football team, from engaging with the West Bank team in order to get to the finals. Yeah. So while Arab countries or Europeans and Americans can come freely, not all Arabs can come, the Palestinians cannot engage each other in, this, uh, in the football teams uh, and, and these um, finals, finalists. But still, there is a need, I don't want to say to reinvent, but to repair the status of Palestine within the Arab world. Mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. We talked about this in our discussion group, that we need to have an in, uh, inter-Arab inter -Arab dialogue on Palestine. There are those who claim that Palestine is not on the agenda, or those who claim that, no, now the Gulf countries are part of a, uh, of a moderate Sunni regime with Israel being part of it, while Palestine is outside the picture. This is not true. I think in my talking to many uh -huh. Arabs throughout the world that Palestine remains a matter of conscience and commitment. Yes, right. Look at all the young people here. I, there isn't a single, including the old people whom we take for granted, but the young ones <laughs> still have a sense really of, of even emotional, not just uh, uh, intellectual and political commitment. But the thank question you. is, yeah, thank you. yeah, Palestine has to be in many ways reinstated within the political discourse, which wasn't here uh, at all. So you were here, much. you could have I was that. here, I tried, to, <laughs> I tried to be a troublemaker as always, right. <laughs> but it has to be reinstated within the region, within the political discourse of the region, because the principle of fragmentation is very serious yes. for all of us, not just for Palestine. Thank and isolation you. is very serious. And Thank you. just to get back, there are, okay, yeah, go I'll ahead. stop. It's just one, one last sentence. No, the thing is, when you talk about American policy, I just wanted to get back. 
That, that, I gotta, gotta go to that do, it is a fragmented policy yeah. in itself. It is, there is no strategy, like Phil said, that you can count on. There are decisions that are taken on the spur of the moment on issues of personal uh, uh, decisions that can be extremely irresponsible and can have grave ramifications for the region. And again, I know that Trump or others are not in favor of a war, but there, are, there is always a risk of an inadvertent war in the region. Absolutely. Uh, uh, Shakar, I need to go to Libya, but I don't want to short, you know, to, 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 I, I mean, I, it's not fair of me. Any one quick word that you want to say, because I must move on to uh, Libya. Sure, since uh, Ms. Hanan Ashrawi here, just to end the thing with Palestine, please let's form good negotiators in this century. Please, we need, new, we need youth representation, we mm. need new blood, and we need a little bit of less psychological complexes from That's the past right. with qualified, 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 please. Si Mohammed, I believe it's uh, Libya is, is, uh, Libya is, uh, uh, sorry, uh, is, is a place where, you know, I mean, a lot is at stake. Uh, not only for the Libyans, it seems that the Europeans feel that there's a lot at stake for them. Should there be um, if, um, an, an big immigration uh, to their, to their shore, through, to, through, through Libya to their shores? But then there's also talk about the migration or the reinvent, Daesh reinventing itself in Libya, all the elements or the extreme elements reinventing themselves in Libya. And then there is this very divided country, you know, between uh, those who think that you've got to beat them and get it over with and take over Tripoli, and, and no matter what, even if you sacrifice democracy or anything else, uh, but accomplish that, and those who oppose them. What, is the be what, what, in your view, is the best thing for us to learn of, of how to think of Libya and what can we do for Libya? Okay. I would like to start uh, at first by saying that we ha I would like to demystify two things. The conflict is Lib in Libya is not between two figures, two people. It's, uh, I think, between two agendas, two narratives. And uh, Hassan Salama, who used to, uh, the UN representative, used to focus on the economic side of the ledger when he talked about Libya last year and even at the beginning of this year. But I think recently in May, uh, when he was in New York, he considered that the conflict in Libya is, uh, is about the political Islam posture in the Arab world and particularly in Libya. So there are, I think, two narratives here, uh, a national uh, stream narrative which would like to, uh, which would seek to reestablish the authority of the state and uh, give rise uh, to uh, a state grounded in the rule of law and a democratic process. On the other hand, you have uh, the political Islam, which unfortunately associated itself with some extremist and terrorist movements uh, that are in Tripoli. And there are uh, statements from the European Union, from uh, other nations about the presence of these extremist elements uh, and uh, uh, terrorists who are fighting right now with a government which has benefited from the int international recognition since 2016. I would like to say uh, after that that um, the, there is another, I uh, 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 would like to demystify another thing. Uh, people say that uh, Libyans should uh, align themselves uh, around a, a, a peaceful agenda and they will have to settle their own differences. Mm -hmm. Uh, with due respect to my compatriots, uh, I have to uh, admit that the decision-making, the uh, uh, margin of maneuver and the uh, uh, independence of the decision-making in Libya has, uh, have uh, in continuously and critically uh, decreased. Uh, one of the, uh, I think, marking uh, uh, demonstrations of that is that we have had uh, many international conferences uh, which have uh, vouched to uh, bring about a political solution. Last year we have, after uh, our summit here in uh, Abu Dhabi, after the Beirut summit, we had 
uh, Macron uh, conference in Paris at the end of May. We had the Italians who uh, retaliated with another conference, which have not been helpful, unfortunately, both of them, because uh, I, I think we had uh, that rivalry uh, between European nations. Now, I would like to, to say that uh, the decision-making is indeed uh, at the hands of the international community. Uh, one of the demonstrations of that, a further demonstration of that, is the uh, conference in Berlin that Mrs. Merkel uh, has convened. Mm -hmm. And we have uh, learned recently that the, the, the Berlin summit would be postponed uh, from uh, November yeah. to December. I uh, would, uh, would agree to that because we need sufficient time to well prepare mm -hmm. and to have a coordinating uh, and follow-up mechanism. What, what have lacked uh, from Paris last year and from Palermo is the follow-up mechanism. I would like to, uh, as I worked at one point for the Arab League, I would like to go back to something that happened in the 80s. The Arab League had a special envoy for Lebanon uh, Mr. Lahd al-Ibrahimi, yeah. but they had also a tripartite uh, ministerial committee made of Saudi Arabia, Morocco, and Algeria, right. which had helped the uh, Arab League special representative to uh, bring through uh, the Taif agreement. Without a resolve, without an international uh, community resolve to fix Libya, I don't think that we can go that far. Uh, uh, last point I would like to make we have heard pertinently and uh, continuously uh, during this conf uh, these two days about Iran. But we haven't heard enough about Turkey. I would like just to recall that Turkey invaded northern Iraq in 2000, December 2015, before the recent incursion into northern, west, western, uh, eastern Syria, we had uh, uh, an increased involvement, military involvement of Turkey in my own country, Libya. And it remains to be seen how positive Turkey would be in the Berlin conference because it has been uh, called upon to participate in the uh, Berlin uh, process. Um, last but not least, there has been also, uh, I think, uh, a statement, a panacea, there is no military solution in Libya. But indeed, there is no military solution in Libya. However, there is a security component that have been uh, 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 understated underestimated, and I, I, I note with interest that the recent uh, uh, ministerial uh, meeting that took place on the margin of the General Assembly in New York about Libya uh, has mentioned, in, not in a, uh, in a preamble, but in a, uh, an operative paragraph, that we need a, a clear-cut DDR in Libya because militia uh, have posed uh, uh, great uh, security challenges to our own security, not only in Tripoli, but in, in Libya at large. Very, very, very clear and with suggestions and with ideas and, uh, uh, okay, now I really need to wrap up, but so I have, look, I've got uh, five facilitators who have got to have the floor. Uh, and again, uh, because they were facilitating these uh, policy circles that have been really a tremendous exercise in, in, in thinking about our region and its relationship with the rest of the world. I also want to, one, uh, one board member who has not had the chance to say anything, I want to know his takeaway, because you see, uh, because Badia, you, you like not to speak geopolitics, so I didn't know when to bring you in, so. You do? You, are you willing right now? So let's give you the, the mic right now. To give a, a constant with what happened in, during these two days. But get the what I see, what, get the I, what, I have, what I have uh, noted, there is a total failure uh, in the political and geopolitical uh, solution in the region. If we, if we go back to what uh, the big politicians, the UN representative, the Arab League representative, and other major uh, players uh, have said, during these uh, sessions, it seems that uh, there is no solution for what is happening in this region. Moreover, peoples, all the peoples of the regions, are left to their own face and destiny. There is a clear disengagement from the Americans, although many peoples in the region have put a lot of hope, at least in the presence of the American in the region, it seems that no, they should find other solutions. The Kurds already took their decision yesterday, 
I don't know what will happen to the other people in the region who have fight or, or fought in, a, in, a, in a, not only military but intellectually, culturally with the, with the European and with the Americans and now it seems that they have to take another choice which they can't. So I think we are, uh, we are heading to another uh, tragedy in the region. The only hope which we can uh, understood from this sessions is the youth yes. and the new technology, the new era that is becoming to come to the region. And this, I don't know if they will have the opportunity to, uh, to exploit it unless there is a wars, or at least what we are hearing now is the drums of the wars. That's Thank you I'm very much. I, I, uh, yes, that's right. Uh, I did not call on you at all, so I owe you to call on you. Uh, if you have the mic, please, uh, I owe you that before I go to the facilitators. Uh, and and, and do, you, do you think that the new relationship between, uh, actually, you know, I, at the point that was raised, and I really wanted to put it to you all, uh, whether China and Russia think that they could have a sort of, uh, what somebody used, not alliance, something. Uh, uh, Andre, do you use that, that China and Russia could do what? Not a condominium, something like that. What is the word that you used? In, in the, in the, in the uh, Gulf in particular, that they could be, you know, to work together. No, yeah, there's no competition. Do you think this is doable without, what, did you, what was the word? I'm saying equity Yeah, well. Yeah, but, right. uh, uh, I, I, he, he, is this, is this what, uh, what uh, you guys are thinking, that the Russians and the Chinese will work it out uh, uh, together so that the Americans could, you know, sort of, uh, uh, Take, take a break, uh, and, and do you feel, after you have listened to everybody, that really, is America going to take a break here? I didn't think that at all. I don't no, but think uh, so. Uh, I, I don't think so as well, because uh, uh, the idea of Andrei Bistritsky uh, was about uh, the project of what, what we name in Russia Greater Eurasia, and what, uh, which corresponds with the yeah. Ch Chinese initiative, uh, Belt and Road Initiatives. It's, it's about to enhance uh, commerce and cooperation in the, uh, in the Eurasian uh, continent uh, in general. It's not about the Gulf. And I think neither Russia nor China uh, are ready now to replace America uh, as the best, uh, uh, as the best uh, guarantee for the stability in the, in the Gulf. Uh, in fact, uh, there, are, uh, there is a proposal of uh, Vladimir Putin, uh, which is, he is exactly uh, now discussing with the Saudi king, and tomorrow we'll be discussing uh, which is? Uh, with, uh, here with uh, Crown Prince of, uh, uh, of the Emirates, is the idea of collective security uh, in the Gulf. Uh, would it be uh, more or less modeled on the European security, like uh, Helsinki, Helsinki process uh, in the Gulf? Uh, would it be uh, utopian or postponed for the future? Would it be uh, open only to the local players, uh, I mean GCC plus Iran? Uh, or would it be open to the uh, larger this, players? Is this what was submitted to the Security Council of the United Nations? Is this the proposal of Russia? Is this the one you're talking uh, about? Yeah, m more or less in general, yes. The idea uh, of collective security in the Gulf region. All right. Well, that's good uh, to we'll find out more about it. I need to go to my facilitators. I, I need to beg their patience and, uh, and like really a summary of what you've done in four hours in two minutes. <laughs> Can you give me two, in two minutes what, is, what do you want us to know from your four-hour session? <laughs> do you really want me to do it in two minutes and not one minute? Uh, yes, one minute would be great, Nick Going. <laughs> I'm just very struck, and I, we've been talking about some very granular stuff here about very immediate problems, but I think there's an overarching problem which we did identify very strongly, and it's come out since we did the policy circle. You asked us to be frank without being um, insolent, and I'm very struck by um, that thought that uh, things are going to get worse before they get worse. I think um, that there is so many things now which are happening in parallel. I come with the framing of our thinking the unthinkable work. And I'm very struck, particularly by the kind of things we heard from the president of Microsoft, by Andre Petri as well, that there are things happening out there which go way beyond these kind of immediate 
uh, conflict and uh, uh, and and um, essentially war issues. There are issues of stability, and it's the speed at which Gadi Fador warned, told us about with quantum computing, the 1% and the speed at which things are happening, the fact that um, Google was able to do something in, in, I think it was three minutes, which would have taken 10,000 hours uh, on a different, on the, on a current computer. I would put to you that while all these are major challenges, there are other big, th massive things happening culturally. I was very struck by, I can't remember who it was who said that, you know, what jihadism is showing is that there's disillusionment in this region, and we're seeing it in other parts of the world as well. Um, there's political jihadism in many p parts of the world, including the country that I came come from and several other yeah. others here. There are massive social forces at work which are being hastened by social media, which are being hastened by technology, which go in many ways beyond the kind of immediate problems of Iran and Syria and Libya. These are potentially existential issues and I put to you the thing that's been driving our work is that thinking the unthinkable. I think it's come through, I have to say, um, in the last 24 hours, 48 hours. It is that the scale and the nature of problems and challenges is simply beyond the capacity of those in power with that kind of level of responsibility to handle. That's not a criticism. And uh, Daniel O'Turk talked about legitimacy several times. And that's where we're heading, the legitimacy of those in power, those in corporate power as well. It's not unique to the Middle East, but on the other hand, it has to be thought about in the Middle East. These are big, big tectonic shifts which are taking place, which I have to say go beyond, well beyond, Putin in Saudi Arabia, Putin here, Iran, Syria, and so on. These are huge things which are affecting stability. And as the theme has come through, it is that things are gonna get worse before they get worse. And I'm not sure that mentally and psychologically, even leaders are equipped for that, that politics is equipped for that, and that's at the heart of all our work on thinking the unthinkable. And I'm afraid much of what I've heard has been endorsing what our, our finding is, the conformity mm. which gets you to the top disqualifies you in many ways from actually understanding the enormity of disruption because it's framing minds incorrectly. Thank you very much, Nick, and thank you for the role you played uh, together with all the facilitators in the policy circles. Thank you very much. Hussein Ibish. Yeah, um, no, I mean, I think that's, that's exactly the kind of um, view that I came away from as well. Uh, th this is the largest and rapidest transformation, socioeconomic transformation in human history, and it is terrifying people all over the world. And in their terror, they turn to the familiar, the tribal, the supranational, or the transnational, or the subnational. Uh, and it's very hard for politics to get a handle on it. My, my group uh, looked at two kinds of problems, uh, internal and pol uh, political problems and socioeconomic problems. And we kept coming back to the question of Iran, uh, as well as the uh, lack of Arab unity and, and Arab agency at the political register. I think because, uh, in, in a way, people feel uh, that difficult as it is uh, to handle, that those are actually problems that uh, politicians and states could deal with. Uh, the other problems are so much greater uh, in register, like uh, the question of uh, treating people as human capital rather than a, a burden on society, migrants and their rights, the uh, challenge of creating uh, an education system and an employment system that meets the social needs, uh, how to manage and uh, get the most out of technology, and uh, pressing issues that really do seem to be beyond the control of politicians, like uh, the need for water, the water crisis in this region. You can, you can start to address those issues, but um, the political challenges, I think we kept coming back to them because they really seem to be more properly, uh, you know, at the register of the political, yeah, and, and therefore could be dealt with. Thank you very much, Hussein Ibish. Firas Maqsad, tell us about your policy circle. If you permit me first to add a comment about um, where we are, what we can look forward to in terms of U.S.-Arab relations, right, just cool. given where I sit on the junction of, uh, of, of those two, having hailed from the region but had my entire professional career in Washington. Um, there is a concern both in the discussions that, uh, that we had here in our private sessions, but also more broadly about the deficit of trust, the growing deficit of trust 
between the U.S. and this part of the world. And you having sharing my background to understand uh, full well the importance of this ancient uh, notion of trust and loyalty that the Middle East has. And if we look back as far as 2003, um, the breach in trust over Iraq and the removal of Saddam Hussein, more recently, of course, the JCPOA, uh, the fact that the U.S. chose to conduct these negotiations behind the back of its Arab allies and in Oman, out of all places. Um, and then, of course, the withdrawal, the surprise U.S. withdrawal from Syria. But also, we, we touched on the maximum pressure campaign in Iran quite a bit. I have to say, I have to say, that one of the negative externalities of the uh, maximum pressure campaign is the fact that we've essentially messaged to the Iranians, the U.S. has messaged to the Iranians that you as much touch our interests or touch our true presence in the Middle East and we will come down on you like a ton of bricks. What we're implicitly saying is, you know, Saudi Arabia, UAE, the other Arab allies, those are within the parameters of what is acceptable. And I think, you know, folks in the Gulf understand that. There is a rationale behind why we are seeing officials from the UAE and Saudi Arabia, whether at an overt level or a covert level, deciding to open a channel with Iran, particularly from now until the November elections of 2020, where they understand that Trump is simply not willing to come to their aid. So this issue of, of the gap, the trust deficit, that we've had between the US and the, the US and the yeah, Arab world for a while uh -huh. that is growing is something that I think about when we're talking about the 2020s uh -huh. and what to expect. Yeah. Point, now to bring it well back taken. to sort of our private discussion uh, and the things that were- Without telling us who said it, that's of course- it's a Because Chatham it was, House, off, because it was off the record, rule, yes. But, uh, but uh, just what did you walk away with? That's it. One of the most striking things for me, and I think this speaks to the importance of the gender balance in these discussions, and, and we had quite a, a good balance, in, uh, is that the, the ladies in the group wanted to talk about softer issues. They wanted to talk about things that are important, like uh, sustainability of resources, access to resources, environmental degradation, the role of technology of these things. Whereas we men naturally gravitated to the hard geopolitics of oh things. Oh my dear, you have you have Daniela Pletka here and Hanan Ashrawi and Maisha Dia, and you're saying that you're I, in I trouble. Am, I am certainly not I saying mean, that. I mean, you cannot say that, <laughs> right, May? <laughs> certainly not saying that women are incapable or uninterested in the geopolitics. But in our group, this was a very clear differentiation, one that was very positive, because we got into sort of the debate as to well, can you really do? Sustain, environmental sustainability and uh, climate change and tackle these issues if you didn't have the basic stability, the basic, solving the basic geopolitical puzzle uh, that would allow you the space to deal with these issues. Uh, and then of course you had the converse debate. And, and the reality is that these two, um, there is a great deal of interdependence between being able to create, I mean, many of our geopolitical issues and we don't recognize it, are in fact caused by climate change and environmental degradation. We need only remember the, the pr recent protests in Iran, but the environment, what's taking place in, in Iraq, the fact that in, the problem in Syria in 2011 was preceded by many years of drought that caused 1.6 million in this place. So these issues are, are not separate and are very much interrelated. And that's something that was a core theme of what we walked away from. With. Thank you very much, Christopher Dickey. And then I'm going to just ask you, General Petraeus, to, to somehow do the, uh, the honor of just uh, the last word. But I'm going to have Christopher Dickey uh, summarize for us what happened in his group, or not summarize, not fair. You, your takeaway. My turn. I'll be quick because I think we're going to have drinks after this, right? Yes, indeed, but yeah. don't tell anybody. <laughs> okay. Which is actually, that we are going to have a wonderful reception. It's uh, going to be, uh, you know, the same place, like on the same floor, go all the way. For those who like to have a cigar, it's going to be there. And uh, yeah, it's, it's been very hard work, but I'll tell you about this in a minute. Go all ahead. All right. <laughs> well, we, we looked at a lot of different issues, some of them different from anything that we've discussed here. One of, the, one of the things we looked at is the question of whether, is democracy, whether democracy is dead as a model in the Arab world. And it depends very much on where you are in the Arab world. Uh, someone said, in Syria, all that anybody's looking for anymore is a dictator that's less bad than the current dictator, not for democracy. But on the other hand, if you look at Sudan, if you look at Algeria, 
These are societies that are struggling to develop democracies now after years and years of dictatorship. And then, of course, if you look at Tunisia, uh, it actually seems to be in stage two of that progress. So all of that was, in fact, good news if you're not in Syria, a country where we have learned that the enemy of my enemy is my enemy. Um, then we also looked at the question, of course, uh, of Iran uh, and whether the Gulf states can learn to live with Iran uh, the way it is or with changes. And I was struck by how little conversation there was about what Iran's own concerns might be. Basically, the consensus in the room is that Iran is the heart of all evil. And uh, as someone said, its design for a Shia crescent is really a design for a Shia full moon in the region. Okay. On the other hand, Iran is a country with a lot of hostile uh, neighbors, including Afghanistan and Pakistan, which has nuclear weapons. Uh, and it also is in a situation where many Iranians, including people in the government, think they're not being unreasonable in their search for a dialogue with the United States. One of the things that you hear again and again from Iran is, we will talk with the, with the Americans if the Americans are willing to lift sanctions not just wave sanctions. If we can talk about getting rid of sanctions altogether, then we'll go to the table. They've said that a number of times. I haven't heard any of that discussed here, but we, did just, we talked about it a little bit in the, uh, in the policy circle. Uh, then we got into big issues like climate change, which is going to have a huge impact, especially uh, in, on the cities and societies here on the, uh, on the shores of the Gulf or any, any uh, cities on the edge of the sea. Uh, and I, and I, I'm not supposed to name names, but one of the people had a lot of very good uh, statistics and terrifying statistics about the implications of rising seas and the huge displacement of populations that will result from that at the same time that we have huge droughts at the interior in, of countries that will create millions and millions of climate refugees. Uh, which is a terrifying prospect, and one that people sort of talk about, but there's not nearly enough preparation to address. Um, a couple of other things. We had one very, I thought, very smart suggestion that if, in the regional terms, in effort to manage water, energy, and agriculture, if you could pull those things together to feed the region better, uh, you could also build better regional cooperation, Education, also hugely important, because that's how you bring young people into the system. But how do you educate them? Because the more educated they are, unfortunately, the more some governments would see them not as an asset, but a threat. Thank you very much. Uh, Gerard Petreus, do you want to sure. please have the last word? Because uh, I then will uh, quickly read something for you. It's prelim preliminary. Uh, uh, look at uh, declaration and then we will proceed to uh, to take some comfort. <laughs> Chair Petraeus. Well, thank you. Um, first of all, let me just say, of course, thanks one more time to you and to our hosts. Uh, the truth is that we come here not just because it's easier to do that than to say no to you, <laughs> uh, but because however long the gathering is, uh, it is always very, very stimulating. Um, I think we probably should say thanks, I guess, to various global leaders who have, just during the period of this conference, uh, provided an incredible uh, buffet of developments uh, on which we could intellectually chew uh, and certainly have provided, uh, again, a great deal to talk about. Um, I am keenly aware that I'm all that stands between us and drinks, and so... <laughs> I thought I would end by just giving what was the bottom line up front uh, on the paper that I wrote for my policy council, uh, as you know. And this is somewhat uncharacteristically downbeat uh, for me. Uh, I think it's, it's generally the case that if you're engaged in difficult endeavors, I mean, like the surge in Iraq or Afghanistan or a variety of the other activities that many here have been part of, 
uh, that you have to have some sense that there is at least a rational a degree of realistic uh, optimism about it. But in this case, my bottom line is a bit more somber. Uh, it is that the future of the Gulf region is one of continued upheaval amid increasing great power competition, discord, and complexity. And on that happy note, uh, may I ask all of us to join me in thanking Ragida <laughs> thank for a you great very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I have one, thank you, thank you. I have one more quick task to, to do, uh, and that is to tell you, first of all, I want to thank you all for all the hard work that you've done for the last two days, but this will not go to waste. Uh, what your contributions in the policy circles, uh, Chatham House rule, together with uh, our deliberations in public sessions, and together with uh, many of you have been very generous in submitting uh, what I have uh, requested of you, you know, papers to tell me what is it that you expect, uh, what to expect and how to prepare when we are thinking 2020s. I've received over 50 such uh, papers, and they are not uh, huge. They are exactly how I asked. They are concise, precise. All of this, all of this is going to be put in a set of recommendations because, as we always say, uh, that this uh, the Beirut Institute Summit uh, in its edition one and two and three, uh, we always say the conversation continues. So our uh, knowledge partner, uh, PwC, are going to put together really a good set of recommendations because your contributions have made it so. But if I may very quickly just give the highlights because I promised them I would do that, and then I, we're all going to be relieved. So this is the Beirut Institute Summit in Abu Dhabi edition three, 2019 declaration as we move into the 2020s we are all of us gripped by the central questions that have animated this conference what to expect how to prepare the complexities that characterize this region are by no means trivial addressing them requires exceptional creativity and expertise as such the quality of the recommendations and perspectives that have arisen at this summit is a testament to the experience expertise and ingenuity of our participants. Delegates and panelists carried on rich, stimulating discussions that touched on a wide variety of issues from regional security and political stability to the importance of technology, education and cultural exchange, along with the critical role of women and our youth in leading us towards a brighter tomorrow. Our conversations highlighted the need to reimagine how we deliver education. This will in turn empower the next generation. The inclusion of youth in policy making and decision making is a vital step in repairing the fabric of our societies. Equally important is the role of women who have been marginalized in the past. Theirs is a crucial role in addressing internal challenges and transforming our politics. Technology naturally remains the most powerful and persistent agent of change in the region. The fourth industrial revolution continues at pace, and today few countries are well positioned to take advantage of the transformation it promises. Mastering the tools and techniques of the digital age will be central to fulfilling our economic potential and enable digital economies through the region. However, not all the change that technology brings with it is positive. New tools, and techniques are, or they do also provide new avenues for sophisticated actors to advance harmful agendas. So Arab countries will need to accelerate their adoption of robust cybersecurity measures to protect their citizens and institutions and ensure that technology is used solely to benefit society. Geopolitics today is rife with uncertainty and the region will need to look inward when push when pursuing solutions to the conflicts and tensions that blanket the Arab region. We will need to engage strategically and selectively with foreign powers and adapt nimbly and swiftly to evolving conditions. International and regional players must further uphold international law and respect good neighborly relations. Even as we strive for peace, we must remain cognizant of how to best manage conflicts in the short term while working towards resolutions in the long term. Where international mechanisms and institutions have faltered, we will need to step in to build and empower our own. Rebuilding our public institutions and how they engage with each other will pave the way for a new model of governance. 
one that is integrated across the region, agile and responsive to the needs of the people and proactive about addressing the challenges we face. In, in, integral to the stability of the Arab region is the ability to create new economic opportunities and secure the livelihood of its population as we move away from our reliance on oil and natural gas. Uh, regional economies will increasingly need to cooperate to explore new economic frontiers and ensure mutual prosperity. Greater economic integration and cooperation will realign regional agendas along shared economic interests rather than opposing security interests. The people of the Arab region possess uh, an entrepreneurial spirit and unlocking the, uh, innovate, the innovative and creative capacities of our entrepreneurs will allow us to unleash a new wave of economic opportunities, particularly for youth and to advance economic diversification that will lead us into a new, more sustainable era. And so therefore, at the end, achieving sustainability in the region is an issue that has emerged time and again throughout the summit and has fostered lively and passionate debate that the threats posed by climate change and red and sorry, and resource scarcity, I guess I'm tired at the end of this, are existential and are more imminent today than ever before. Together, we must redouble our efforts, investing not only in renewable energy, but also renewable resources, hastening our transition to a knowledge economy and deploying both technical and political solutions to address fundamental issues of food security, access to clean water, and environmental degradation. In the weeks to come, the themes I have just mentioned here will headline a detailed report highlighting unique and dynamic policy recommendations that have been proposed over the course of the summit. It is my hope that the work we have done here and the work we will continue to do together in the years to come will serve as the basis of a transformation that will see our region soar to new heights and fulfill the dreams and aspirations of its people. We can only do this together. Uh, this can only be accomplished, actually, if we continue to have the input of fabulous people like you coming from all over the world to think with us about the future of this region and its relations with the rest of the world. And that is a task that could not have been done could not have been touched without great people like you. I thank 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 you. Thank you very much. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.